So far we have looked at the temptation of Adam and Eve, then last night the temptation of Joseph, and this morning the temptation of Hezekiah. If you want to read the full account of Hezekiah, which is really what is ideal to understand the passage before us, then you really need to read 2 Kings 18 to 20, and then the parallel account in 2 Chronicles 29 to 32, and a further parallel account in the prophecy of Isaiah, chapters 36 to 39. The story of Hezekiah shows up in three places in Holy Scripture, and each contributes a little bit of something. We won't have time to explore Isaiah at all. I will draw your attention in a few moments to one or two details in Second Chronicles. For the moment, however, let me begin with 2 Kings chapter 20. I shall read the entire chapter. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, This is what the Lord says. Put your house in order because you are going to die. You will not recover. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Before Isaiah had left the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him. Go back and tell Hezekiah, the ruler of my people, this is what the Lord, the God of your father David, says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you. On the third day from now, you will go up to the temple of the Lord. I will add 15 years to your life, and I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. Then Isaiah said, prepare a poultice of figs. They did so and applied it to the boil, and he recovered. Hezekiah had asked Isaiah, what will be the sign that the Lord will heal me, and that I will go up to the temple of the Lord on the third day from now? Isaiah answered, this is the Lord's sign to you, that the Lord will do what he has promised. Shall the shadow go forward ten steps? Or shall it go back ten steps? It is a simple matter for the shadow to go forward ten steps, said Hezekiah. Rather, have it go back ten steps. Then the prophet Isaiah called on the Lord, and the Lord made the shadow go back the ten steps that had gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. At that time, Marduk Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent Hezekiah letters and a gift because he had heard of Hezekiah's illness. Hezekiah received the envoys and showed them all that was in his storehouses, the silver, the gold, the spices, and the fine olive oil, his armory, and everything found among his treasures. There was nothing in his palace or in all his kingdom that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and asked, What did those men say, and where did they come from? From a distant land, Hezekiah replied. They came from Babylon. The prophet asked, What did they see in your palace? They saw everything in my palace, Hezekiah said. There is nothing among my treasures that I did not show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, who will be born to you, will be taken away, and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. The word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied. For he thought, will there not be peace and security in my lifetime? 
As for the other events of Hezekiah's reign, all his achievements and how he made the pool and the tunnel by which he brought water into the city, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? Hezekiah rested with his ancestors, and Manasseh, his son, succeeded him as king. This is the word of the Lord. It is possible to have a good beginning but a bad end. Ask Judas Iscariot. He'll tell you. Or think of Demas, apostolic associate, yet he loves this present evil world and turns aside. It is possible to have a bad beginning, but a good end. Ask Saul of Tarsus, arch persecutor of the church, yet nevertheless apostolic missionary, writer of one quarter of the New Testament, Christian martyr. Ask Manasseh, king of Judah, Hezekiah's son, mentioned in the last verse of the passage we read. He reigned a long time and was a wretched king for almost 50 years. But toward the end of the life, he repented. During the time of Manasseh, he reintroduced idolatry to the nation again. External tradition says, almost certainly correct, that he had Hezekiah, uh, had, had Isaiah killed. When he was a very old man, Isaiah ran into the forest away from the troops that were following him and he hid in a hollow tree. The troops found him and wrapped a rope around the opening and then cut down the tree. You recall how Hebrews 11 says some were sawed asunder, almost certainly referring to that event, of whom the world is not worthy. Yet nevertheless, even Manasseh, for all his cruelty and idolatry, ended well. He repented. And the last period of time in his reign, he was an excellent king. So. It's possible to have a good beginning and a bad end. It's possible to have a bad beginning and a good end. It's also possible to have a decidedly mixed race where there may be excellent features in your life full of signs of grace and yet sadly in some domains make a lot of mistakes. And that brings us to the first point. It is possible to be basically, a faithful and fruitful servant of the Lord in many domains and yet fail miserably on more than one occasion along a certain kind of line. One thinks of Abraham, for example, father of the faithful, patriarch, the one who is of only two who are called in Old Testament scriptures friend of God. Yet the man lied more than once and got his wife in trouble, under real danger, because he was afraid. This was the father of the faithful. And then, of course, the quintessential man along these lines is David himself, called uh, a man after God's own heart, yet an adulterer and a murderer, and a really wretched father, a really stupid father. Then there's Eli, a faithful, godly, pious priest in the days of Israel. Yet not only is he a bad father, he doesn't have the wisdom to discipline his own sons who, when they become priests, they are actually fleecing the people of money, they, they are corrupt and actually sleeping with some of the women who come to the assembly. And he has no courage to draw the line. There is family, nepotism rules. So although he is himself in many ways a godly man and a fine priest, he's a danger to the community because he succumbs to nepotism. And amongst these people, we could add Hezekiah. Hezekiah was in many ways a great king. We should not minimize his God-graced accomplishments. Look at the opening lines of chapter 18. In the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, a young man. And he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. 
so he died at the age of 49. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. He removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. In other words, he reformed the nation by getting rid of the idolatry into which many people were increasingly sinking. He even, we're told, broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made, for up to that time the Israelites had been burning incense to it. You recall the account in the book of Numbers. Moses had ordained that this bronze snake be made by God's own instruction to counteract the poisonous snakes that were biting the people. They were biting the people because the people had slunk once again into idolatry. They were whining and complaining and ungrateful. Snakes arose that bit the people and then as they cried for help, God ordained that Moses build this bronze snake and put it on a pole. And those who looked to this snake were healed. Not because the snake, the bronze snake had some intrinsic power, but as a sign of God's grace. But now this bronze figure in storage somewhere, has now been taken out and is treated as a kind of talisman, a good luck charm, a little piece of magic, spiritual power. Then people are actually offering incense to it. And Hezekiah is smart enough to realize that although this is an historical artifact of some significance, uh, once it has become an idol, it has to be destroyed. So he grinds it to power and powder and destroys it. He was a great and theologically smart man. Indeed, we're told, verse 5, Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. He held fast to the Lord and did not stop following him. He kept the commands the Lord had given Moses, and the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. From watchtower to fortified city, he defeated the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory. And then the account goes on to talk about how he withstands the regional superpower of the day, namely mighty Assyria, barbarous, cruel Assyria, first under Shalmaneser and then under Sennacherib. And in both cases, God gives him grace with spectacular display of miraculous power to, to, to endure. <clears throat> the Assyrians came in and captured the northern ten tribes, Samaria and north, in 721 BC and transported the leaders into their country. But when they attacked Judah and Jer Jerusalem and so on, then under Hezekiah, they were turned back. They were turned back. Eventually, 185,000 Assyrians died of the plague or something else that God sent along. But in one of the threatening letters that they sent, there you have the account of, of how Hezekiah takes the letter and goes to the temple and spreads it before the Lord and says, Lord God, I can't handle this. This is too big for me. But this is a slight on your name. Will you not take action? He, he was a man of faith and resting in the Lord God and turning to him again and again and again. You must realize this is the man we're talking about, a great leader of the Old Testament. And yet, and yet, as we'll soon see, there is another side to this man. It turns out that on more than one occasion, he demonstrates the same pattern of sins, of arrogance, of pride, of foolishness, of short-term thinking. He does not really persevere consistently across the whole set of the domains of life, and he does not end very well. My father was a pastor, a small town pastor, church planter in French Canada, when it was quite difficult to plant churches in that part of the country. There was a lot of opposition. Baptist pastors alone in French Canada between the year 1950 and the year 1952 spent a total of eight years in jail. We kids were sometimes beaten up because we were maudit protestants, damned Protestants. During most of his lifetime, Dad preached to vast crowds of 10, 15, on a good Sunday, 30, 35. Toward the end of his life, when there was more growth in the church, he finally had crowds of 60 or 65. He faced discouragement. And then when he was an old man, his wife, my mother, succumbed to Alzheimer's. And from, for nine years, he looked after her. During much of his life, he sporadically kept a journal. 
this was not meant for publication. It was a journal that was addressed to God. It was, it was uh, the summary of his own wrestlings with God and his thinking and his prayers and so on. And of course, all of those papers came to me as the eldest son after my father died. And eventually, the most important of that material I put together in a small book called Memoirs of an Ordinary Pastor. You see, the fact of the matter is we sometimes hold up well-known pastors who are gurus and so on. But 95, 97, 98 percent of the ministry today is actually undertaken by pastors of small churches and small corners who are not known and who sometimes face discouragement. My dad was one of them, memoirs of an ordinary pastor. But one of the cherished bits in that journal was his prayer as he got to be an old man. His wife by this time had died and he was on his own. Now with mom gone, he could take up preaching again and visiting. That's what he did. He was at this point 78. And he wrote in his journal, Heavenly Father, save me from the sins of old men. Save me from the sins of old men. And he listed them. Jealousy of young men who are coming along behind who are more fruitful than I. laziness, insufficient prayer for my children and grandchildren, and understand my father was a man of prayer. A willingness too quickly to turn on the television in order to meet my loneliness, bitterness, save me from the sins of old men. For you see, what you must understand is, this fight will be with us until the end. When you're young, you might think, I guess I'm being so heavily tempted now because I'm young, but when I'm middle-aged, I'll finally be stable, and when I'm an old man, I'll be a godly saint. Listen, I'm old enough to tell you something. The fight does not get any easier. There's a possibility of being tempted and falling astray at any age of your life. The only thing that's going to fix that permanently is resurrection existence in the new heaven and the new earth, the home of righteousness. And until then, we still live under the constraint described by the Apostle Paul. The flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit wars against the flesh. And we are therefore exhorted to walk in step with the spirit. Paul understands this perfectly well. After he has been a fruitful apostle, a missionary apostle, for a solid 20 years, he nevertheless writes, 1 Corinthians 9, Therefore I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Listen, I know ministers of the gospel who served faithfully and fruitfully decade after decade after decade after decade, and then in their 60s or 70s committed adultery and were removed from the ministry. This side of glory we will never be so stalwart that we can afford to think we are above temptation. This man of God, Hezekiah, has some domains in his life that he never truly comes to grip with. Number two, God's people, not least his successful people, quotation marks, his fruitful leaders face peculiar temptations in four areas. God's people, not least those widely regarded as successful, face peculiar temptations in four areas. Number one, false priorities, especially in relation to death. False priorities, especially in relation to death. 
We read, in those days Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, this is what the Lord says, put your house in order because you are going to die. You will, you will not recover. <clears throat> now, if you do the mathematics, the Lord gives him out of this event 15 extra years of life. That means that instead of reigning 29 years, if he had died earlier, he would have reigned only 14 years. So this is 14 years into his reign. He takes the throne when he's 25. So this happens when he's 39. He's a pretty young man. And he gets the news, it's time to put your house in order, Hezekiah. And Hezekiah is a bitter man. What do you do when you get news of this order? His response is very different to the response of the Apostle Paul, who says, whether it's better to die or to live, I'm not quite sure. It's better for you, I guess, he says, if I live, because then I can minister to you the word of God. But quite frankly, it's better for me if, if I go. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, he says in Philippians chapter 1. In other words, it's a very different, different view of life and death. One of my friends in Britain not too long ago was diagnosed with terminal pancreatic cancer. He was told he had about six months to live. In fact, he lived a little longer than that, but not much. And the first thing he did was write a letter to the congregation where he was the senior minister. And he said, I want to tell you what a great blessing this is. Most people don't know when they're going to die. I do. <laughs> and as a result, I have the opportunity to prepare and to prepare well. And prepare well, he did. He made sure that he gathered his family around him, took his kids on holidays together while he still had any strength, built up memories, charged them again and again with the gospel, made sure there were no bad relationships, did as much as he could to make sure his wife was looked after. Do you see? I know when I'm going to die, you don't. And therefore, I will prepare. What a different attitude from Hezekiah. Do you see? Three times in my life, I've had diseases that could have killed me. Now, transparently, they didn't, as far as I, as far as I can tell. <laughs> and in one of them, when I was really quite ill, I, I had some Christians come to me and say they were, they were praying very diligently that I would survive, that I was needed in the kingdom, and yada, yada, yada. I couldn't bring myself to pray that because I remembered Hezekiah. Would it be better to live longer? I was in my early 40s at the time. Would it be better to live longer? But who could tell what the future might be? I remembered the line of an old hymn, Oh, let me never, never outlive my love for thee. So I prayed instead, yeah, for my wife and children, it's surely better if I stay, but I'd rather die now, Lord, than live longer and bring disgrace to the gospel. If by living longer, I end up falling away and bringing disgrace to the gospel, take me home now. I don't want to live. Hezekiah lived longer. And he made a mess. False priorities about the most fundamental realities of life, life and death. Second, Self-righteousness, verses 2 and 3. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying, God, you owe me. I'm one of the good guys. Doesn't the text say, after all, that he was an heroic king, a good manager, secured the frontiers? He was a godly man. He, he, he was a man who, even during the following 15 years, was courageous with respect to the Assyrians. At that time, the regional superpower was the Assyrians. The, Babylon, the Babylonians were still on the horizon. They were far off. But 
Scripture itself says that he was a man like David, a good man. And now Hezekiah says, if all of that is true, don't you owe me a little more than 40, than, 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 uh, than 49 years of, than, than uh, uh, 39 years of life? Don't you owe me a little more than that? In other words, he's beginning to think of the relationship between himself and God as a kind of tit-for-tat a relationship. You scratch my back, I scratch your back. I'm pretty faithful to the covenant, therefore you're generous with me. Because I've been a good king, therefore you owe me long life. And as soon as you start thinking in those terms, you've changed the entire nature of biblical religion. What does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 4? What have you but what you received? And if you've received it, then why do you boast as if you hadn't? So even his ability to be a good king and to be faithful and courageous and so on, all of that was given by grace. It's not something that he could barter with before God. What do we have to barter with before God when all that we have is from God in the first place? Do you see? The root of self-righteousness is the wretched suspicion that we are actually offering something to God. As if we bring something to the table that we don't have from God in the first place. What we are overlooking is the very nature of God's gracious, sovereign, providential rule in our lives. Number three, pride. Pride. Especially verses 12 to 18. I'm sure you remember the account of these emissaries from Babylon. Now at the time, as I said, after the fall of the northern tribe, 721 BC, the regional superpower that was really dangerous was the Assyrians to the north. But over to the northeast, there was the rising power of Babylon, still not all that strong on the Tigris-Euphrates river system. Eventually, Babylon would smash Jerusalem in 587, 586 BC, about 140 years later. So it's not around the corner. At this point, nobody saw Babylon as a threat. Assyria was the threat. It was Assyria that destroyed the northern tribes. Babylon was not a threat. But these Babylonians were shrewd people. They were thinking ahead. They were sending emissaries around to all the little petty nations around, getting to know them, pretending they were friends, but quietly taking notes of the wealth and the strength and the fortifications and the nature of their armies and how much money they had and so forth. They were taking notes. So they come to Jerusalem under the guise of being concerned for Hezekiah's ill health. And Hezekiah decides to show off. That's what we're told. Indeed, 2 Chronicles makes it even stronger. We read in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, beginning at verse 24, In those days Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. He prayed to the Lord who answered him and gave him a miraculous sign. But Hezekiah's heart was proud, and he did not respond to the kindness shown him. Therefore the Lord's wrath was on him and on Judah and Jerusalem. He was a proud man. Then Hezekiah repented of the pride in his heart, as did the people of Jerusalem. Therefore the Lord's wrath did not come on them during the days of Hezekiah. So this Hezekiah, in other words, turned out to be a proud man. Not only self-righteous, but we're told that Hezekiah received the envoys, 2 Kings 20 verse 13, showed them all that was in his storehouses, the silver, the gold, the spices, the fine olive oil, his armory, everything found among his treasures. There was nothing in his palace or in all his kingdom that Hezekiah did not show them. In other words, he was acting as if he were a mini emperor. He was beginning to sound like Nebuchadnezzar would a century and a half later. Is this not mighty Babylon which I have built? He's saying, in effect, is this not mighty Jerusalem which I reign over? He's strutting like a peacock. Isaiah the prophet is not deceived. He challenges him. Who were those chaps? What did you say to them? And eventually he declares, verse 16, Hear the word of the Lord, Isaiah says to Hezekiah. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your predecessors have stored up until this day will be carried off to... 
Babylon, which didn't even appear as a threat. Not going to happen anytime soon. It's not yet the regional superpower. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, that is, your own children or children's children or children's children's children, your own line, some of them, your own flesh and blood, born to you, Isaiah's really rubbing it in, will be taken away and they will become eunuchs. They'll be castrated and serve as eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Pride. Simply pride. Do you know, this is a particular problem for Christian leaders who are successful. You get to a certain point and you think, I know how to do this. I've got a track record. This is the 24th year of this conference. Starting from 60 people, now 1,200, give or take. Growing steadily. Do you know what one of your greatest dangers is? That you start thinking, we know how to do this. Because you see, in a sense, you do. You know how to preach the word, to focus on expository ministry, genuine Christian confessionalism, and so on. You, you do know how to do it. You're gaining expertise in how to run a conference, and so on, so on, so on. Do you see? But now you can become so good at it that the Holy Spirit could get up, walk out, and you never miss him. Because you know how to do it. That's one of the reasons why sometimes old men begin to destroy what they built up because they start succumbing to pride. It's a bit like the pride in the Gibeonite affair recorded in Joshua chapter 9. The Israelites are successfully invading the country, protected by God. And then when the Gibeonites show up and, and they flatter the Israelites and say, you know, we've heard that God is with you and we heard that you're so strong and you're powerful, so we've come a long, long way. Look at our moldy bread. We've come a long, long way. We're no threat to you, but we'd like to have a covenant of peace with you, a treaty. And the Israelites, feeling preened and puffed up, they say, sounds like a good idea to us, and they, 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 they sign a treaty. But they did not consult the Lord. They were no longer self-consciously dependent on God. They thought they knew how to do it. Pride. Fourth, complacency and love of personal comfort. Complacency and love of personal comfort. One of the saddest verses in the entire book of two kings, indeed one of the saddest verses in the whole Bible, is verse 19. Isaiah tells Hezekiah that Jerusalem will be destroyed and that the nation will fall and some of his own descendants will be castrated and serve as slaves in the court of Babylon. And what Hezekiah says by way of response is, the word of the Lord you have spoken, the word of the Lord you have spoken is good. He even casts what he says as an air of piety. Whatever God says should be, it is a good word. But the text says, for he thought, will there not be peace and security in my lifetime? What should he have said? After all, when earlier he had been told there was a word from the Lord saying he was going to die, then he interceded with God and turned his face to the wall and cried, why don't you have mercy on me? May I not have more life? And God gave him 15 more years. Shouldn't he have cried here? Lord, if this is a threat of, on my children and my nation and my city, this covenant city, because of the sins that I have fallen into, have mercy on the city. Have mercy on my children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Have mercy on your covenant people, O oh God, and, and bring forgiveness. Bring forgiveness, I beg of you. Do not let my sins bring judgment on the nation. But is that what he prays? No, he's quit fighting. He's into a slow decline now. 
He says, the word of the Lord is good, masks what he's really thinking with pious phrases. What he really hears is, it's going to be the Babylonians do it. That's for a later period. So that doesn't concern me. I'll be dead by then. I don't care. <laughs> Grotesque. Do you see, there are some people who, as they get older, begin to get really cranky. We'll come back to this in a moment. They begin to destroy what they build up. Because in old age, they just want not to be bothered. They're no longer thinking about the future. They're not planning anymore. They're not trusting God. They're, they're not wondering how to stabilize the next generation of Christians. How very different, for example, is the heart of the Apostle Peter. Do you recall what he says in the first chapter of his second epistle? 2 Peter chapter 1. He says, verse 12, I will always remind you of these things even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body because I know that I will soon be put it aside. I know I'm going to die as our Lord Jesus has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, that is after my death, you will always be able to remember these things. Here is a man who's still thinking beyond his own death about how to institutionalize the teaching of Christian confessionalism, teaching the scripture, teaching the word of God, teaching the gospel. He's institutionalizing it so that even after his death, the church will still be able to remember the, the, the structure, the, the nature, the, the heart of the gospel itself. He's not saying, well, you know, it's really about time I slow down. Just don't bother me anymore. I'm just going to spend the entire final span of my life until I get bumped off as a Christian martyr. I know that's coming. Can't duck that one. Jesus said it was coming. But until then, it's about time for me to slow down and just spend time with my grandchildren. It's not his attitude. But it's Hezekiah's attitude. Complacency. Love of personal comfort. When we succumb to such temptations, we may place ourselves in such desperate plight that God will simply leave us for a bit as we fumble along in our inconsistency. Finally, I want to offer an essential element in godly perseverance. You see, the temptations that I've been talking about in this third address are the temptations that come to all Christians on the long haul. They're Christians that, they're, they're temptations that we face that, that chip away at our desire to persevere. Temptations that particularly come to successful Christian leaders. Pride and arrogance and inconsistency and love of comfort and so on. Now an essential element in godly perseverance is remembering. Remembering. Now, that's already triggered by the passage I just read in 2 Peter. I want you to remember what the heart of the gospel is. So I'm doing everything in my power to enable you to remember. But this is a big theme in scripture that has to do with ongoing, stable sanctification. For example, Exodus 13.3 regarding the Passover. Commemorate this day. The day you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out of it with a mighty hand. Now, God could have given them the Passover, the initial Passover. He could have seen to it that the angel of death passed over the land and the people were saved if they had the blood of the lamb and the two doorposts and the lintel. And that would be all there was to it. But instead, God himself says, now that you've been through the Passover, commemorate the day. Year after year after year after year, remember. Because if you don't remember, you'll turn away from the Lord. The whole point of commemoration is to remember your utter reliance. Whether you recognize it or not, your utter reliance on God's grace. You would not be where you were today apart from the Passover. And then when the Decalogue is given, when the Ten Commandments are given, both in Exodus 20 and in Deuteronomy 5, we read words like these, these from Deuteronomy 5, but similar things are found in Exodus 20. Remember that 
You were slaves, and the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand. Therefore, and then the Decalogue is given. Do, do, do you see? You remember the grace of God in the past. Moreover, that is also well articulated by Moses in another remarkable passage, Deuteronomy 17. This is at a time when there are yet no kings in Israel. The kingship has not yet taken place. It has not yet begun. But Moses looks forward to the time when there will be a king. And he says, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 and following. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us, be sure to appoint over you a king the Lord your God chooses. Then he tells them several things that the king must not do. Then he says, 17, 18, this is what you are to do. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from that of the Levitical priests. So. He comes to the throne, first day in office. What's he supposed to do? Audit the books of his predecessor? Nope, not mentioned. Appoint a secretary of state? No hint of it. Make sure he puts his cabinet in order? No mention of it. What's the first thing he's supposed to do? He's supposed to take out a quill pen and copy out longhand all the words of the book of the law, which either means the book of Deuteronomy or the whole Pentateuch. Don't forget, there were no photocopy machines. Nor could you download things from a CD and stick it on your hard drive without it passing through anybody's brain. <laughs> no, he's to write it out for himself longhand. And he is to write this Hebrew script line by line, letter by letter, so clearly that it becomes his own personal reading copy. Why? Why should that be his first obligation when he gets into office? The text tells us. This copy, verse 19, is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees and not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites and turn from the law to the right or to the left. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. In other words, by constantly rereading, reading and rereading what God himself has disclosed, he remembers. He remembers the book of the law. He remembers the word of God. He remembers what God has done. He remembers the Exodus. He remembers who he is. He remembers this, that he stands by grace. And he will not puff himself up and start lording it over other people or turn aside from the, to the left or to the right. He will remember. Do you see, one of the reasons why we have church services why we meet together under the Word of God is to remember. Not every sermon will teach you something brand new. Now, a good expositor will constantly be bringing forth new things from the Word of God. That's true. That's true. But there's an awful lot that goes on from Sunday to Sunday that is not meant to give you some tantalizingly fresh tidbit some insight that you hadn't seen before. So that the only reason you go to church is to find out something brand new. Part of the reason you go under the word of God in the assembly of God's people is to remember. That's also the fundamental reason why you keep reading your Bible. Did, did you see? If you've read your Bible several times, you might start saying as you read a parable that you've read 10 times, 12 times, 20 times before, well, I know that one. I don't have to read that one again. But one of the reasons why you do it is one of the reasons why the kings of Israel were supposed to do it. To revere the word of the Lord, not turn aside to the left or to the right. Do you see what stabilizes you is not your victories, but remembering God's grace in the past. And indeed, that is the fundamental reason why we have the Lord's table. In fact, the fact that God has given us the right, the R-I-T-E, the right of the Lord's table, is in some ways shocking. Really shocking. God saves us by the blood of his Son. He demonstrates his love for us and that while we're yet sinners, Christ dies for us. Christ bears our sin in his own body on the tree. 
The wrath of God falls on him. He is the propitiation for our sins. And because of his stripes, we are healed. He was wounded for our transgressions. You'd think that because of all of that, our lives would be characterized by an endless array of praise. Think what we have received. Forgiveness from sin, freedom from death, resurrection existence still to come, the gift of the Holy Spirit as the down payment of the promised inheritance, all secured by Christ's death. And now we have to be given a right to be told to be thankful. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. Because Christ knows that we, his blood-bought people, are still so sinful that we easily forget. Even in the context of our churches, we can be so busy setting up committees and expounding on the nature of worship and thinking through the book of Revelation and expounding the prophecy of Jeremiah and making sure we get the parables right, that somehow, somehow, God help us, we actually forget the cross. We don't actually concretely abolish it. We just no longer have it at the forefront of our minds. And so Christ in his perfect gracious wisdom has given us an ordinance, a rite in the church, whereby again and again and again we hear the words, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for many for the remission of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Isn't it shocking that Christ has to give us a right to remind us to be thankful for all that he has given us? But one of the reasons why we celebrate the Lord's Supper, not the only reason, but one of the fundamental reasons is precisely to draw us back again and again and again to the grace of God, especially the grace of God in the gospel, in Christ Jesus, the cross and the resurrection. For that is what stabilizes us, what enables us to fight temptation. This demand to remember in a right way comes up again and again in Scripture, of course. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 9, as they're crossing the lake, they realize they've forgotten some bread. Jesus, talking about the false teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he says, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, referring to their dangerous doctrine that can come in and corrupt the entire dough. But they don't get it. They think, is he saying something about bringing bread? Yeah, we know we forgot it. And Jesus says to them, don't you remember the feeding of the 5,000? In, in other words, how can you really imagine that it? it's such a disaster to have forgotten a bit of bread? I can provide bread. I proved that already. Don't you remember? We're not going to starve to death. If I can feed 5,000, I can feed 12. Hmm? Don't you see? Don't you remember the feeding of the 5,000? Or again, Jesus in John 15, on the night that he was betrayed, remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. Remember, remember. Small wonder, Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, remember the Lord Jesus, descended from David, raised from the dead. In my corner of the world, in North America, two men that have had an outsized influence on Christian confessionalism in North America in the 20th century are Kenneth Conser and Carl Henry, both dead now. But they were stalwart, they were broadly within the reformed camp, stalwart in their insistence on inerrancy. They taught a whole generation to think, and they had a great deal to do with much of what was good in evangelicalism in North America in the 20th century. In the 1980s, when they were both in their upper 70s, they were both by this time old men, we invited them at Trinity, where I teach, to give two hour-long lectures, an hour each, to our students. We had six or seven hundred students at the time. They packed out the chapel. And what we asked them to do was to give their take on what the face of confessional evangelical 
reformed Christianity looked like in North America in particular from their vantage point after decades, more than half a century of Christian experience and Christian ministry. Their lectures were both interesting and scintillating. And then the next day we met again and we had an hour long interview. I was the one charged with interviewing them to ask them some probing questions. What do you think of this movement? What do you think is going on here? What's the future going to bring here? Just to ask them as aged, wise men of lar large experience what they thought the future was. I didn't tell them in advance what the questions would, would, were going to be. But toward the end of the interview, you can see it for yourself, it's all online, it's, it's all videotaped and available. Toward the end of the interview, I asked them, tell me, how have you two men turned out the way you have? There are a lot of old men who become cranky, controlling, bitter. They no longer the, have the energy of the young men and they resent it. They can become a bit jealous of the young men. They constantly remember the old days. But they're no longer thinking about the future. They're no longer supporting and encouraging young men. They expect to be honored more than they want to encourage and pass on the baton to others. They're, they're not praying for the future anymore. They begin to guard their preserve. And as a result, they begin to destroy what they started to build. We see a lot of old men like that. But neither of you is like that. Both of you are constantly encouraging a new generation coming along. You're looking to the future. You're full of joy in the Lord. You're, you're thanking God for your years of service. And you're finding ways now in your diminishing years with diminishing strength still to serve honorably and in a godly way. How are you managing to do that? Why aren't you two cranky old men? Don't tell me, I said to them, that it's the grace of God. I know it's the grace of God. I know it's the grace of God, but how has the grace of God worked out in your life so that this is the way you've turned out as opposed to being cranky old men? And they were both embarrassed and didn't know what to say and sputtered a little bit. And, and then finally Carl Henry said, it's the best quotation on the entire video. He finally said, how can anyone be arrogant when he stands beside the cross? You see, he remembered. Hezekiah forgot. And was increasingly viewing things as his preserve. And was in danger of bringing things down on his head and the head of the successors after him. How can anyone be arrogant when he stands beside the cross? Let us pray.